All right, Victoria. Yes. Victoria, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I was technically born in LA, but then moved down to San Diego when I was like three years old. South San Diego, so like Imperial Beach. It's right next to the border. Mm -hmm. And tell me about your family growing up. I have one older brother. Um, we're two years, seven months, three days apart. Not that we're counting. Um, and I got both my parents who are still married to this day. And it's been like 36 years for them. And it's just always been the four of us. How would you describe your childhood? I would describe it as really happy. Um, well, I'd say happy-ish. Just because I grew up feeling depressed and anxious a lot. But outside of like what was happening with me, it was a relatively happy childhood. I grew up on a street with like 12 other kids that were all the same age. And it was great. Like lemonade stands, tag until dark, like picturesque. Sounds great. Yeah, it was really nice. And then I moved from South San Diego to another part of South San Diego, which was more affluent. And things changed a lot. Like I was kind of a culture shock going from like, I was like the smartest kid in school to no longer being that like at the new place I was living at, or it was kind of like a weird culture shock. Moving is always tough for kids. Yeah. And how far did you go to school? Oh, um, I'm completed high school, got my bachelor's, and now I'm getting my master's program. Or I'm in a master's program for teaching. You told me you had some rough patches between then and now. Yes. Um, so I've been hospitalized for my bipolar disorder and depression and anxiety. Um, there was times I wouldn't go to school for years because like my anxiety was too much and I couldn't just function. So I had like periods of being like on and off of school, um, not working sometimes. And it was really tough. It like really affects you. Like the, 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 the bipolar, uh, started showing itself when? Oh, the bipolar disorder started showing itself when I was in high school. Mm. Um, I, I knew something was wrong and I didn't know how to tell my parents that. My brother had ADHD and he was super hyper all the time. So my parents paid a lot of attention to him um, for that reason. And for me, they kind of just thought, oh, she's fine by herself. You know, she's, she's chill. Um, but that was really hard because I started noting some symptoms. Like my mind was always racing. I was always, I was being really erratic, um, really impulsive. And I just had like this really, really like dark periods of depression and then these crazy periods of, like mania and feeling fine and everything's great and perfect. And it was really hard, especially being in high school, because I didn't I didn't know that I had bipolar disorder. I didn't find out until I was 19. And we should have picked up on it a lot earlier because a lot of my mom's family has bipolar disorder. My great grandmother had schizophrenia. So we probably should have like thought about that. My mom has clinical depression and um we, they just didn't like pay that extra attention, but I knew something was up at a younger age. I had had anxiety since I was in like third grade, um, but I never thought like, oh, I'll have, I'll have uh, bipolar disorder someday. How would you describe being bi bipolar for those that don't know? Being bipolar, it can be really fun at times, but those times are usually really damaging. So when I'm manic, everything is like beautiful and it, you know things are shiny and you can do anything you want and that's so hard when it comes crashing down and you enter this depressive episode and i'm a rapid cycling type one bipolar or person with bipolar disorder so that means that i get oh man i can have huge mood shifts in one day which is really wild um and it's hard to stay on top of that and you can go from really erratic to so depressed you don't want to move. And it's pretty severe in that it could happen so often in just one day or in a very short period of time. Because a lot of people are type 2, so it like spreads out for longer periods of time for them. Or they might have short mania and a long depression. So having this like constant roller coaster of emotions is exhausting. And it just, you feel pretty defeated um, after a while. But I try and like maintain a really positive point of view on it. I like, I think about like, okay, this isn't something that I chose to have. This is something that was, that just happened. It's not my fault, but you still feel like this kind of weird guilt of being like, oh shit, I have like this, you know, mental illness and it's going to affect me the rest of my life. And it affects the people I love and my family and stuff. So you feel like a little weird sense of guilt for having it, even though it's like out of your control. So it's, it's a struggle, the depressive episodes, the highs, um, 
thankfully I'm like more stable now because after I went to the mental hospital, I met this doctor and he asked me like, does your family have bipolar disorder? And I was like, yeah. Are some of your, are they stable? And I was like, yeah, they're, some of them are really good. What do they take? And I told them medication and they said, um, you know what, you have similar chemistry, we're just gonna try that. And that like totally saved my life. Beforehand, I couldn't handle being in a relationship, having a job, going to school, and now I feel like I can like function more. I feel like, okay, I can, I can manage life and I can live it and I don't feel like so constantly overwhelmed and guilty and exhausted. What was the medication that you were taking? Abilify. I take like four medications for my mental illness. Um, I take Abilify, Lamotrigine, Buspirone, and um, sometimes Clonopin. Um, but with Clonopin, it's kind of harder because it's a benzodiazepine and I actually overdosed on it um, because a doctor's directions where he had me taking four to five pills of Clonopin a night um, to try and sleep to help with my depression. And I was on that for years. And you're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be for emergencies. And I, I, I was in like a really, really depressive episode. I was like suicidal. And the uh, doctor told me like, oh, you know what you should do? Just, I want you to take six tonight. So you sleep and you'll feel better. If you sleep, your depression will go down. And I ended up overdosing that night, which was really, really painful and really scary. But before you were on the medications, what, was there anything that you saw that triggered it? The ups and downs? Um, the seasons, when the seasons would change. Uh, I noticed my moods would start getting really crazy for a while. Um, in the summer, I would be like more manic. So I was like, I started to notice like, oh shit, like these, some of my friends don't want to like hang out with me right now because, oh, sorry. <laughs> some of my friends don't want to hang out with me because I'm like scaring them. I'm being so erratic. I'm driving like 120 on the freeway and um, it would just come randomly, but mostly during the seasons or like high summer. That's when I'd have all that energy and all that sunlight and just go off. So it's, it's can be unpredictable sometimes, but it's, it's a mostly just a wild ride. What was the darkest thing you went through? Um, um, I would say shortly after I was diagnosed, I was really manic for a while. And then I went into like such a depressive episode. I had to withdraw from my university I was at. I didn't leave my room. Um, I wouldn't see friends for days. I wouldn't talk to anyone. I would obsessively paint my nails. I would watch like just movies constantly. I'd go to sleep at 8 a.m., sleep until 7 p.m., walk to the store, get some food, and just stay in my room. The only reason I left was just to use the restroom. Other than that, I didn't talk to anybody for days and I had to like medically withdraw from school and I had to come back to San Diego and I felt so defeated. I felt like such a loser that I couldn't handle doing school. It was really hard um, because I always wanted to do that. Um, I've had a couple like kind of breakdowns. Going to the hospital was one of them too. That was, I was like in a relationship at the time and I just felt like my head was like collapsing in on itself. And I just, I told my parents, like, I need to go to a hospital. Like, I can't live like this. So then they took me and um, I was there for a pretty short stay. Um, but it was just, I felt like, what's the point of life? Like, why am I even here? What's the point of living with something that will never change? And it's just gonna get worse with age. Like, it felt pointless and like, you feel upset because you're just like, I want to be able to live a carefree life. I want to be able to go and do what I want with friends or go on a trip and not worry like, do I have my meds? Do I have contact with my doctor? Do I have all the things that keep me from like, um, like melting down or having like a, a manic episode or a depressive episode? And it's hard, but you just learn to live with it. With like, I have, you know, I'm lucky that I have like my family and I have resources to me, like medication, thanks Medi-Cal. Um, so that helps, but it's still definitely like hard to go through an experience. It's exhausting, but I, most of the time I try and stay more positive. Um, just cause like, what else can you do? Life is hard enough. Um, might as well try and put a positive spin on it most days.
It's got to be tough on your romantic partners. Yes. Um, I think that it's really important. Like, because I've been diagnosed, it's like my responsibility now to take care of myself, not only so that I can be happy and exist and live a normal life, but also because the people who love me and the, my, my friends and my family, they don't deserve to have to like run after me in a manic episode or, you know, have to pick me up every time I'm in a depressive episode. Like it's, I know they'll do it because they love me, but it's not fair to them. I want to be an, an equal partner. I want to be a friend who could support others and not have all the focus on me all the time. And so I think it's like my responsibility to take care of it. So I try and stay on top of it as much as I can, but it has been really hard on former partners. Um, I was in a really abusive relationship with someone who was going through their own stuff, but I was like wildly erratic and I would go through these skyrocketing highs and these crazy lows. And it was just so toxic. Like he wasn't a really toxic person, but so was I at the time because I was really sick. And like to this day, I still feel like a sense of guilt about it. Like he wasn't a good partner, but I wasn't either at that point. Did he have other issues other than bipolar? That... Did he? Yeah. He, um, this was like my first big boyfriend. He had like really bad depression. Um, he was like a huge narcissist too. But each of the boyfriends I've had or my long-term relationships have had some level of mental health issue. I guess you just seek what's familiar, I guess. Does being bipolar make you attracted to people that are who also have like mental health challenges. They're unstable mentally. I think, I think it's just because it feels familiar and you feel like, oh, this person understands what I'm going through. We could fix each other. Like it doesn't work like that, but you're just, you get drawn into that because you feel like it's familiar. So it feels safe, but then it ends up not being safe and it ends up just like snowballing and getting worse. And that's not fun and it's really tough. Um, but like, thankfully with the relationship I'm in now, which I hope to be in forever, um, I, it is stable and he's like the most stable person I've ever been with and it's like healthy and it just, it feels really nice. That's so nice. like the medications help you. Yeah. The medication. Maintain that relationship. Yes, absolutely. The medications have really helped me maintain this relationship I'm in. And I've always told him like, if it ever comes to a time where I'm scaring you, or you're really concerned for my mental health, please tell me because I don't want to lose this amazing person who has made me feel like so fulfilled and has loved me unconditionally. I don't want to lose them because I can't, because I choose not to take care of myself mentally. My God, I'm getting emotional. I didn't think I would, <laughs> but yeah, I just really care about this person and I want to be with them. And I'm thankful for meds because it's made it possible to be with someone like, in a healthy way when in the past before I found those meds that worked I was just with people who didn't make me feel good or I just felt like confined or whatever else it's just it's hard relationships are hard in general but when you throw mental illness into the mix it just makes it like a wild ride mm. so I've had like three big relationships the first one was uh the abusive one with uh depression the second one I met in an outpatient program um, he was really like withdrawn, very quiet. And I almost saw it as a challenge. Like I'm going to become his friend because I'm the kind of person who thinks that there's no such thing as like strangers, just like friends I haven't met yet. I'm just really chatty. <laughs> um, but I met him and we ended up becoming friends and eventually we started dating, but he was schizoaffective and he had just recently been, um, homeless for, I think like eight or nine months in Los Angeles, San Diego, like all around California. Um, but he was like, he was really sweet and he cared for me immensely. Um, but it was, he definitely wasn't stable, which was difficult. And like now looking back at it, I realized like, wow, he really wasn't stable. Like I was looking over a lot of stuff because I was like in my own sickness at the time too. Um, but then what added like even more fun to the mix was that he was like a Hare Krishna, which like he self describes as a cult. Um, I know that like the people from the Hare Krishnas were always really nice to me. So I don't necessarily have like complaints about them besides some of the restrictions, but 
he was a, like a hardcore Hare Krishna. Like he would meditate for three and a half hours a day. He didn't eat mushrooms, onion, garlic, like this huge list of food, which drives me crazy because I'm such a foodie. <laughs> um, and then he was also like devoutly Catholic where he would like on a Saturday night or like on a Saturday go to church and read like the sermon for people. But then on Sunday go to the temple and like do like the mantra and the singing and the everything else and listen to this to the like scripture and i still don't know how that works to the Hare krishna yeah it's the Hare krishna so saturday catholicism sundays sometimes the catholic church and the temple but like he always tried to explain it to me but it never made sense to me but he became Hare krishna in the first place because when he was homeless he was in venice beach and the people, um, there was a bunch of Hare Krishnas there, and they met him, they talked to him, and they saw he was pretty sick. So they, they took him, like, under their wing. They took him to, like, a farm in Central California where he worked, and he was able to stay and be safe. Um, so I think that's, like, one of the big reasons why he was really committed to the Hare Krishnas was because they kind of saved him in a time where no one knew where he was. He, was un he wasn't safe. He was delusional. Um... So, like, they're kind people, but it's definitely pretty culty. But he was devoutly Catholic, devoutly Hare Krishna, and he found a way to make it work that I don't understand to this day. But he seemed, he wasn't stable, but he seemed happy. Like, that was, like, his kind of way to try and stay stable was, if I meditate for three and a half hours a day, if I don't do this, this, and that, if I don't eat these foods then I should be fine. But he was still going through delusions and he was still depressed. Um, so I think he was trying to be like a band-aid on what he was experiencing, but he, he just didn't want like medical intervention. He wanted to do it himself. And I feel like he really, um, he really missed it. He really misses out on life because he's not getting the help that he could get and the help that he needs. And he's just like, going through his existence rather than just like enjoying life and living. And that makes me sad. I don't talk to him really. Maybe once a year I'll say hi, happy birthday. And it just, it hasn't, he hasn't changed much. And I just feel really sad for him because I hope he could find someone like he really loves and be in a relationship that's healthy and that he can do what he wants to get married and have kids someday. But he's not like, utilizing what he has to get better which is sad to me and like i just wish him the best what was the craziest point of that relationship so he really loved me and he he really loved me and he was really sweet um but he wasn't like taking care of his mental health like he should be he thought like using these band-aids on like this broken bone was going to work and it Things started going kind of sour when I remember we built garden beds. We built them from scratch. We, we planted this garden and it was beautiful and we we're exhausted. After like a whole day being in the sun, we, we were making dinner and he was really quiet. And I was like cutting like onions or something or I don't know whatever, or not onions. <laughs> he didn't eat those, but something. And I remember he was really quiet and I asked him like, hey, what's up? Like, what's going on? And he told me, he's like, I just like had this like delusion in my head or just like this vision of me like getting that knife and like stabbing you in the back. And I was like, oh my God, holy shit. Like, I didn't want to make him feel bad because I knew it was involuntary, but like my stomach just like crunched up. I was so scared. Um, and like, he didn't tell me some stuff after that for like a while, but probably after like five months, we were together for about two years. After about five months, he would tell me like, yeah, I just, I had this like picture in my head of me like shoving you to the ground or of like smacking your hand away or like hitting you. And like, I knew like, okay, I don't feel, I don't feel safe around this person anymore. And he may love me as much as possible and he may care for me and be kind but I don't feel safe being around someone who's like has these active thoughts of like, oh, I want to stab her in the back or I really want to punch her right now. And I just realized like 
I couldn't live with having someone envisioning wanting to hurt me. Like that was really, that was hard. And I just knew like, okay, this, I can't do this anymore. I need to be with someone who wants to be better or wants to get better and who doesn't want to scare their partner. And so then I just kind of like, I invited him over one day and I was like torn apart because this person just like put so much effort and love into our relationship. And I remember telling him like, okay, I think I can't do this anymore. I'm sorry. I love you so much, but I'm done with this. And like, he felt so guilty for it. And he felt so bad that like his unchecked mental health was, was like in the way of him having like his happily ever after with me. And that was hard. Like sometimes I miss being able to talk to him um, because we had like a great friendship, but like knowing that it's still kind of unchecked for him. I don't want to, I don't want to be like that subject again of like, Oh, that, or that object, or I don't know what else of being like a person he could hurt. Like I'm not down (laughs) with getting hurt by someone else. I already have hurt myself enough growing up and dealing with stuff. I don't need to add a physical component to it. So it was hard, but I had to do, um, I just had to end it as compassionately and as lovingly as I could. And here I am four or five years later, still missing them sometimes, but realizing like, it's okay. I, and just like hoping for the best for him and that he'll find like whatever peace he's looking for and whatever help he needs. But until then, I'm just, just doing what I do and trying my best in my relationship now and trying to be healthy and just love and be kind to others. So I'm trying my best. Mental illness makes relationships tough. Yeah, it makes relationships really tough, which is pretty unfortunate. Um, But it's just, I guess, a fact of life for me Um, and for everyone else who lives with mental illness. And that's, that's, it's difficult to swallow for sure. Like having anxiety constantly like I do, like I have so much anxiety right now, but I just like learn to live with it. And I just try and like talk to myself in my head and be like, you know, you're going to survive this. You're okay. You are not crazy. This is something very real, Um, but you're going to be okay. But sometimes it takes more than just self-talk. It takes like meds and therapy and everything else. I'm 29. 29. Yeah, my, so I remember having my first panic attack in like third or fourth grade. Um, And I remember having this insane panic attack, not knowing what it was. And then the next day when I woke up, I felt like everything going on in my body. Like I have like this extreme phobia of like getting sick. And I was just like hyper aware of everything I'm feeling. And it never says stop to this day. And I know that you have like a normal awareness of like, oh, my stomach kind of hurts or, oh, I have a headache. But I'm like, my why is my heart going faster? Why is this or that? And it's just constant. Like I live in this like constant state of anxiety and fear that has like gotten stronger as I've gotten older. No, and <laughs> I take like meds to like curb it a little bit, but because I'm so happy with like my bipolar meds, I don't want to mess around with like my meds and like fix them mo- or move them around more and like be unstable for a while to get rid of the anxiety. Like I could handle the anxiety a lot more than I can the depression, um, but it's, it's, it's tricky. I'm, I'm afraid to lose my stability in terms of my bipolar to help with the anxiety. And I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive to what I'm saying, but it's, it's scary and I'm trying to like work it out, but I need more help. And it's kind of hard when like you can't see your doctors very often. And when they give you medications that like don't work and send you off, um, so it's, yeah, that like taking the wrong meds could just send you on mania or make you super depressed. And then you had to like start from scratch all over with the bipolar meds. And so it's, it's a little scary to do that, but I need to practice what I preach and I need to go and get it taken care of, but I'm just trying my best right now and trying to live like a happy life um, with all of its weird business in the middle of it. (laughs) 
are there things that you've learned that you wish you knew when you were younger? Um, that may have helped you manage all this? I'm not sure. Can you like clarify a little bit? Well, I mean, like, like it seems like you've, you've finally figured out at least some of the bipolar issues. Yeah. Are there things that you wish you knew like when you were in your teens that you, you may have been able to manage it better and avoid some of the things you went through? Um, I think, I think if I had a way just to be like more aware of what was going on. So like I was just acting as I was, I wasn't thinking like, oh wait, take a step back. Look at what you're doing. Like kind of like metacognitive wise, think about what you're thinking <laughs> and see like, is there something weird with that? Like, I wish I was more aware of what I was doing, but I was just like blindly going at whatever and just erratic and everything else. But I wish that I could tell like younger self or like me when I got diagnosed, I felt so hopeless. Like I remember my mom crying when the doctor told her like, oh yeah, your daughter's bipolar. Cause my mom was like really scared because like with her family, the instability and like, I felt so guilty. And I wish I could tell my like younger self, like you're gonna be okay. Like this is really scary. And I understand that, but it's not your fault. You're going to be okay. It's going to take some work, but you have like people around you who love you and you're not alone in this. So you're going to be all right over time, but like, don't, don't go driving 120 miles per hour on the freeway anymore. Like, don't do that at least. But, um, yeah, no, I, I just wish I could be like kinder to younger me instead of being like, Oh, I should have known this. Just be like, no, you know what? You were doing your best and you didn't know, but now you do. And so it's like trying to forgive like myself for being so hard on myself, like what I've done growing up. Like, I still feel like this weird guilt about like, I often wonder how many people that I scare away that were friends, how like my family, like who thinks like, oh, she's crazy. I don't want to hang out with her. Or like, how many times has that happened because of my mental illness? And I like ponder on that a lot, which is hard. What advice would you give to somebody who's struggling with issues like what you've described um, that, is, that has not found a like a, a solution? A, a solution at all? Um, I would say like first and foremost, like be kind to yourself. That's really hard, um, and I know that's not like tangible, but just be kind to yourself and try and talk to the people around you and ask them like, hey. Is there anything like kind of off you've noticed? Like, have I said some things or have I done some things that you're a little concerned about? I had a friend who told me like, yeah, I stopped hanging out with you because you were so erratic. And I remember feeling like, wow, I wish you had told me that. So like asking those around you who are close to you, like, hey, I just, I feel kind of weird. I feel kind of off. I don't know why I'm doing this. Like, have you noticed? Um, cause sometimes it takes like hearing it from other people to be like, oh, wow, that is not good. Or I didn't realize I was doing that. So just be kind to yourself and talk to those around you and ask them. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's important to do. And Victoria, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Hmm. <sighs> Even when you fall flat on your face, whether it's mental health reasons, relationship reasons, or whatever else, even when you fall flat, you're still moving forward in some way. Um, progress isn't perfect. And it just takes like being kind to yourself and others to just keep going. And with time, you'll be all right, hopefully. <laughs> All right, Victoria, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks. And good luck from here. Thank you. I'm glad things have stayed a lot for you. Thanks. Thank you.